If you want to remove your negative items permanently from your credit report, just send out this one letter that the bureaus have received 1.5 million times and boom, your negative items are going to be removed. Well, that didn't work and that's why you're here. You still have your negative items and now it's even more difficult because they've been verified as accurate, right? Well, today I'm going to give you 13 different things that you might be able to find on your credit report and I'm going to put them in order of impact that you can use to support your argument for inaccuracy or a violation and get them removed permanently. Now, I'm not telling you that this is going to happen on round one, but I am telling you that these are what I use and what I look for, just a little part of what I look for to remove accounts permanently for thousands of clients. All right. And this is all part of creating the perfect dispute letter every single time. And if you want to check this out, which is not part of this video, it's down in the description. You can also find things there like the link to schedule a call with me. If you want to see if I can personally do a credit suite for you or the free credit sweep course, 100% free. If you want to figure out how to do this yourself and just need a little bit of guidance. All right. So let's get started. What can you possibly look for on your credit report that can be used to support a factual argument? We're going to start with the most important, which is date last paid. Now, why is the date last paid important? Well, it actually stipulates when your account's naturally going to fall off. And if the credit bureaus are reporting three different dates, it's actually going to fall off at three different times. And we don't want that. So, this is date last paid. It may, depending on where you pull your credit report from, be listed at the bottom of the account or at the top of the account. For uh, both Identity IQ and Smart Credit, which are the only two sites that I recommend, and my affiliate links are down in the description if you wanna check that out, it's actually towards the bottom of the account. All right, so that is number one. Number two, date last reported. Now. A lot of people don't really understand why date last reported is so important. Well, here's the thing that you might not know. When you dispute an account and it comes back verified as accurate, and I'm using air quotes because you know there's actually no verification that takes place or an investigation, the credit bureaus are required to change the date last reported or the status update date to be when they verified as accurate. However, if you disputed, they verified, and it comes back, and this date is still the same. It means they did no such investigation, all right? So that's number two. Number three, and this is always going to be number three for me. It can be in any order that you want to, but we wanna hit them with a huge violation. And I'm also going to give you a little bit of a secret. And again, stay to the end because these 13 things are found on virtually all credit reports, depending on what you have, all right? So notice of dispute. I'm also going to tell you how to use this. So why is the notice of dispute important? Well, it's important because it tells your potential lenders, your current lenders, that you have a problem with this account and that there might be an issue with it. And they're actually required to put this in the comment section of your account within 30 days from the date of first receipt, right? Your first dispute letter. If it's not there, it's a violation of section 623. Now, here is a little bit of a secret. The bureaus are much more likely to enter this notice and not be in violation within that required time frame than the collector. And I'm referring to a third party debt collector, not a debt buyer. Okay. So this is the reason why if I have a client that has, you know, third party collections, I'm actually going to dispute directly with the third party collectors using the validation of debt because they're less likely to enter this notice. And then on that next round or about 14 days later or so, I will then dispute with the credit bureaus. Now, if my client actually has late payments and charge offs and whatnot, they're actually going out at the same time as those collector letters. It's only those third party collections that are not being disputed until after I have first disputed directly with the collectors using the validation of debt. And then this way you can either collect you can either catch the bureaus in a violation or the collectors, and it's going to make it much easier to remove the negative items quickly, all right? Now, first date of delinquency. That is a big one. If there's anything that I could find on a credit report in the payment history that would be inaccurate, it would be first date of delinquency. Not only can it be inaccurate, but it's virtually impossible to verify. Why is that? Do you know how late payments can be legally verified? Well, if you do know, 
post it down in the comment section. If you don't, I'm going to give you another secret here. Man, this video is just full of secrets. The only way to legally verify a late payment is for the actual data furnisher, Credit One, Capital One, American Express, whoever it is, to furnish a copy of their bank statement, proving when you did or did not pay on time. They're not gonna do that, and therefore, it's hearsay and cannot be legally verified. All right, so look for that first day delinquency. Even if you don't look for that first day delinquency, maybe it's the same date. Well, hey, guess what? I paid on time for X date. Where's the proof that I didn't? Okay. Now, another thing, and we're going to go into this next, is payment history. Go and check out all those late payments. Are all three bureaus reporting the same dates for each of those late payments? Nine times out of 10, you are going to find a discrepancy where Bureau 1 is reporting this date, but Bureau 2 is reporting that you actually paid on time, but they instead are reporting that you paid late on a different date. It has to be the same information. I was either late or I paid on time. I cannot be both, okay? So this is why it's so important to go and pick apart your account and look for these dates and these amounts and things that are reporting where they shouldn't be reported, okay? And this is why I'm giving you this information because it can quickly remove your negative items, all right? Monthly payment on a closed account or monthly payment on a charge off. The account's closed. I'm not paying monthly unless I am and I have a repayment agreement or some sort of something where I am paying back and I'm paying back monthly. Go and look at your closed accounts, even your positive ones, because your positive ones might actually be closed, but report that you're paying monthly when you really are not, okay? And you're going to want to change this because it's going to show that you're paying more monthly than you actually are. But this is a great way, if it exists, to remove whatever closed account it is, a collection, a charge off, whatever, all right? Another one is the high balance being reported lower than the balance. In case you didn't know, what the high balance is, is the highest balance the account ever had, right? So you can't have the balance be $1,000, but the high balance be 500. No, it's the other way around. You may owe $500 right now, but the highest the balance ever was, was $1,000. So if you see that the high balance is lower than the balance, then hey, guess what? That is an inaccuracy. Balance on a transferred or sold account. Why is that important? Well, again, we're dealing with something that just doesn't make any sense. This account is no longer being owned or held or whatever by X company, right? X data furniture. Therefore, they cannot report it. They don't have it anymore. The company or the data furniture that can report it is that new data furniture. So here's an example. You have an account with Capital One and they charge it off. It said that you owed $1,000, but now Portfolio Recovery comes along and says, hey, you owe us $1,000. Now, if they're reporting on the credit report and that original collection is reporting on your credit report, only Portfolio Recovery can report that balance. They can both be reported, but with zero balance with the original creditor and the $1,000 balance with that debt buyer. All right, so they can both report, but only one of them can report the balance. Now, that also brings me to put in a side note here. If you have multiple collections for the same account, that is also something that should not be on there. It should only be the actual collector that is currently holding that account. All the other ones need to come off. So it can be the original and the current collector, all right? So if it gets passed around, you're gonna wanna track it and make sure that it's only with that company or that data furniture that is currently holding that account. Limit on a collection. It's a closed account. It's not an open-ended account. Why is there a limit? There should not be a limit. Another thing is go and check out the actual status. Is that collection open? I see that all the time. I dealt with that just yesterday and guess what? I used it to dispute that account. Now, this account should never report as open, not when it gets on there, not while it's on there, and not while it's leaving. If you have a collection, it should report as closed. There cannot be an open collection. It's not an open-ended account. Lates on a collection. Go and look in that late payment history. If you're seeing 120 days late, um, 30 days late, just late anything, late payment status, guess what? Collections should not have a 
past due. They should not have a limit. They should not have late payments. They should not have any of that stuff. It can report that you have a balance on a closed collection. That's totally fine. But none of that other stuff that would otherwise report on something such as a charge off. All right. Now here is another one. And this is number 13 double jeopardy. What the heck does that mean? Well, we just went over it actually. So double jeopardy is when you have multiple data furnishers reporting a balance for the same account. Capital One reporting $1,000 and portfolio recovery reporting $1,000. So your balances are now going to be $1,000 more to someone potentially looking at your credit report than it actually is, right? You really only owe $1,000. So why am I uh, why am I seeing $1,000 here and $1,000 there? That obviously means $2,000 when I only owe $1,000. That is double jeopardy, okay? Another thing is you're not always going to see all of these. I'm giving you 13 because Number one, I see these all the time. Number two, they have a very high impact. And number three, they're going to give you the potential to quickly or remove your negative items quicker from your credit report than if you just send out some ambiguous dispute, not understanding what you're doing, not understanding what to look for, and not understanding how to use it, all right? So that is why we are going over this. Now, if you don't know how to actually write dispute reasons for these accounts, now, yeah, okay, I have three different dates. Yeah, okay, I have double jeopardy. Yeah, okay, I have a past due on a collection. Yeah, okay, my collection is reported as open. Yeah, okay. Okay, there's a violation for the notice of dispute. How do I write that actual dispute reason? Well, that is where this again comes in. How to write the perfect dispute reason every single time and how to write the perfect dispute letter every single time. Now in this, and again, you can go check this out down in the description, but it's going to have you walk through a checklist, right? So you have a dispute letter checklist, and then you also have a dispute paragraph checklist. And then you have a checklist for creating your actual dispute reason. So every single part of your account, um, every single part of your letter that you need to write, this is going to walk you through step-by-step step creating it. So here is an example. So um, go through the checklist before sending out your dispute letter. And this letter includes no more than two paragraphs before your disputed account. Letter includes no more than 10 accounts. Uh, disputed account includes no more than one dispute reason. Those are examples. And then your actual paragraph is your why paragraph, right? So I'm writing this dispute letter because... What's your reason for writing the letter? What do you want the credit bureaus to do? Why do you want them to do it? Did they perform their duties on the previous, you know, round correctly? What is the outcome you're requesting? And then ask for a new investigation and a new credit report. And then writing your actual dispute reason or breaking down your account, taking that information and plugging it directly into this formula. Why are we using a formula? Well, I've got a number for you and I'm not trying to act like we're in a negotiation or anything, but I'm going to write it down. And it starts with a five and it ends with a bunch of zeros. And the number is 50,000. What is 50,000? 50,000 is the number of negative items that I've removed over the past four years for my clients using this same exact formula. So does this work? Yes, it does. I just created a very, very simple way to help you structure your disputes using the facts to support your argument to get your negative items removed permanently. All right, so if you wanna access this, this is absolute gold. You can either get the actual physical version shipped to you and um, you can, or you can access the digital version. So I'm gonna give you both links. All right, so if you have questions about this, Use the comment section. I'll help you if I can, all right? I've tried to break this down and give you 13 different things that you could potentially look for on your credit report right now to create that perfect dispute letter to go out and remove your negative items, all right? Now, again, if you don't wanna do this yourself, if this is just too much, then hey, that's all right. That's what I'm here for. You can use the link at the top of your screen or down in the description and I'll see if I can help you. We'll just jump on a call. All right. Otherwise I have some very helpful links down in the description for you. And guess what? This is not difficult. It's just frustrating because remember the bureaus are in the data business. 
They are there to keep it on your credit report. We're there to remove it and we need to be the ones that win in the end, all right? And we will be because you are going to like, comment, and subscribe so that you can increase your credit score, remove your negative items, and move on with your life and just not have to deal with this anymore, all right? So I will see you next time and I do have a workshop coming out that is going to help you remove these negative items permanently, all right? You'll find that coming out very, very soon. So again, make sure that you subscribe. All right, I'll see you later.